Hey everyone, good evening. It's Tracy coming to you live from New Hampshire Dog Walking Club headquarters. And I am here tonight with Laura Gendron of Misbehavior Training. How are you, Laura? Hello, I'm good. How are you tonight? Very well, thanks. I'm really glad that you are here because we have a very important topic to go over tonight that I think a lot of people will be able to identify with. And before I have you introduce yourself, I want to just, uh, you know, reach out to people listening and see if you have been with our community for a while. You may remember that about nine months ago, it was like the end of August, beginning of September, Laura went live with us about this trend we were seeing with dogs. And she coined it. Actually, did you coin it pandemic pup? Was that your term? No, not my term, but it's okay. something that I had heard a while back and it just flows beautifully and it fits. Yes, I agree. So what we were doing is we were talking about this trend that she was seeing with pandemic pups in this area. And I'm going to have her explain to you what that means. But now here we are nine months later and we're seeing as people are going back to work, kids are going back to school and the dogs are being left alone. We're seeing the results of that time where the dog was only exposed to its owners, whether it was a puppy or an adopted rescue. And we're really seeing some interesting behaviors that we wouldn't have anticipated. I know as, as a pet sitting and dog walking company, the, the behaviors are very new to me. So, you know, Laura, before we get into this, can you just briefly explain what exactly a pandemic pup is? Yeah, so when I'm referring to it and from what I heard originally, um, pandemic pup is pretty much, it's a puppy that was either adopted during the pandemic or just prior to it where, you know, their prime socialization window kind of happens within the pandemic time that we've been in. So I would say if I had to give it a timeline, probably at this point, um, maybe a dog that is two, that you've had for maybe two years or less. Um, because even even like a six month old dog or so that you kind of either just adopted um, or you had had for less than six months, I would still count that as pandemic pup. And we're not talking puppies only where I call them pups because I just feel like that's just a nice friendly term for dogs. <laughs> um, so, yeah, any age, it doesn't matter. But um, but just this idea that, you know, they've sort of grown up with you, even if you got them when they were three years old or five years old, but they've grown up with you within this pandemic period. So either they've got maybe a little over attached to you or um, or they've just spent a lot of time at home, in your home with you um, or with any part of your family and maybe just not enough time getting out and about and socializing. And for some dogs, some pups, actually I would have, you know, five years ago said maybe a little less socializing because we don't want to push them into people <laughs> all the time. But, you know, it's obviously, it's a little polarizing the way it is right now. So. Um, that's pretty much what I refer to when I talk about pandemic pups. <laughs> yeah, so I'm really glad that we're going to discuss this tonight because we've had some clients call us kind of in a panic because their companies have shifted and all of a sudden they're going back. Their kids are all of a sudden going back to school, yet there hasn't been a plan or much thought put in place in regards to socializing their dogs prior to this absence. And so the dogs are so confused. They don't know what's going on. They're, you know, their people are gone for extended periods of time. And then these strangers come in and walk them. And it's like, what? I don't get it. What's going on? <laughs> so we're going to talk with you about that tonight. And I want to let Laura introduce herself and her company too, so you can get a better sense of her, her expertise and how much she's been working with these types of dogs over the last several months. Yeah. So uh, my name is Laura Gender, and so I run Misbehavior and um, I I used to do all in-home stuff before the pandemic and then I moved over to virtual everything. <laughs> everything went virtual. Um, so I because I have young kids at home, relatively young kids, school age kids. So I decided that in order to help them and be here for them while they were homeschooling, I would just cut out all the in-home stuff and go virtual. And I kind of loved it. So and I still love it and I still want to be doing it now. Um, I ended up starting a membership so that I could kind of reach more people and help more people at once. And so I'm doing private stuff and the membership stuff, but I have definitely found that my niche tends to be in either really emotional dogs. I would say reactive. A lot of people think reactive though means aggressive and that's not what it means. Reactive just means dogs who 
they have a um, they over respond to something in their environment, whether it's a trigger, you see it as a trigger or a stressor or something that just makes them really excited. So when I say reactive, I just mean a dog who is very responsive, <laughs> over responsive to something that happens in the environment. Um, so my niche has definitely become the more reactive dogs. And there are plenty of those, unfortunately, with the pandemic stuff, um, the pandemic pups or, or dogs that were really well socialized up until they were like three years old. And even those dogs are struggling and they need some sort of remedial socialization, which we're going to talk about tonight. But, um, but that definitely, I've always had a soft spot for the really shy dogs. Um, so, and I really, you know, I love working with puppies. I love working with manners and all that sort of stuff. And that all comes into play, but there's just something about those, really those dogs who have that extra, they need the extra stuff. They need like you to sit down and really kind of make a plan for them and all that. So um, I'm sure that I will be talking plenty about that type of dog tonight too. So, and you know, we want to hear your stories. We don't want you to feel embarrassed if this pertains to you because there's no way we could have known you know, what these dogs would experience because, uh, I mean, most of us have never lived through a pandemic. So, uh, you know, dog trainers were, you know, doing research and networking with each other to try to come up with, you know, tips and resources and educational um, things for uh, their clients so that you could deal with this. But it's not something you should be embarrassed about by any means, but we want your questions because we want to hear how you're struggling so Laura can help you. And then as an incentive, what we want to do is if you ask a question during a live presentation, Laura is giving you a chance to win a, a one month free membership in her virtual canine homeschooler academy. So can you tell us a little bit about what that is, Laura? Yeah, so the academy is my membership. So that is basically, it's where I have um, people who come in and, and they're dealing with all kinds of different stuff. So they might be dealing with puppies who just need to learn manners. So I have um, manners courses in there, like how to teach your dog to sit, how to teach them to stay, how to teach them to come when called, stuff like that. And over the months, what I've done is we've had challenges every month and I've turned some of the bigger challenges, the ones that are more common problems, like come when called, um, jumping on people, counter surfing, jumping on the counter to try to get food, uh, leash walking stuff. So every time we've done a challenge, if it's been a common problem, I've actually turned it into a little course. So now the membership also has those mini courses in there. So you can kind of go at your own pace with them. But the great thing, my favorite thing that I found, I've I've had it open since um, October. And my favorite thing that I found is the just the continued support. So like as you're working through some of this stuff, you have that continued support to to help you. And I'm in there maybe a little too often, um, but definitely at least every day <laughs> answering questions. Um, so people have found that to be, I think, more helpful than anything else. I think the course stuff is great. I think at this point, you know, um, what I'm seeing with the weather changing and with everybody being able to get out and about is they're kind of like, okay, get me away from the computer. <laughs> I want to be out in the sunshine now. I want to do my thing. And you can still do that with the membership stuff, with the virtual stuff, but it's like you learn what to do and then you can go work on it. And if you need to rewatch stuff, you can certainly do that. So I'm definitely finding that, um, that has been really helpful in the last couple months too, as people have been starting to go out and about, they're like, Oh, but, I kind of forgot what I was supposed to do so I can refer back to this. So lots of videos, um, lots of support for, you know, continuing to work on stuff. And like I said, I'm in there probably too often. And then we do challenges every month. Some people will partake in it every single month and they're rock stars and it's awesome. And others kind of pick and choose which challenges they want to do. And I actually just started a second tier to it um, because some people were like, I don't necessarily need the challenges right now, but I just want the support. I want to be able to ask the questions and get get you like you're in my pocket all the time able to answer them so i started a second tier to it too which is a um just includes basically the the um, q a opportunity within the facebook group in a couple of courses essentially that go along with it so you can kind of go at your own pace but then you can um, also get discounts on other stuff going forward if you wanted to add anything on later so it's kind of it's changed over the months for sure um, but only because I'm getting great feedback from members and they're telling me what they want less of or want more of stuff like that. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you for giving that away because it's an incentive for people to get out there, ask us your questions. Yes. And I do have a couple of comments coming in um, mm -hmm. Laura, before we start. So Michelle says that she feels like we've made some progress with Brutus before the pandemic, 
feeling like we are starting all over, although he's surprising me, still much work to do. Yep. We and really it, Michelle. Yeah, there are a lot of ups and downs, especially <clears throat> with adolescent to young adult dogs. Um, and I'm pretty sure Brutus, I'm trying to remember how old he, maybe like two-ish possibly, but, um, but there are lots of ups and downs with them and you know and it's a lot of like for every you know five steps forward it might be a couple steps back and then steps forward again and maybe a couple steps back and it's ups and downs but the idea is that as you make good momentum moving forward that those those downs are gonna you're gonna be able to recover from them much faster your dog will be able to recover from them much faster because you're gonna have some stuff in your pocket that you can like you can pull out and be like oh my dog knows how to do this so let me apply this and sometimes you need help making a plan for that um so you know you might need to sit down and really focus on that or reach out for help with that but it's kind of like okay well if i'm out and about with my dog and he barks at somebody who's coming down the street this is what i'm going to do so in the moment you're not like oh wait oh, hold on what was i supposed to do i'm not sure Okay, let me do that. You know, you want to have that like that plan. <laughs> like, yeah. okay, if this, then that. So I'm big into the if. I mean, a lot of my members will say that you say that a lot. If this, then that. So what is your plan if this happens? And you can't plan for everything, but you just do that the best you can. And then your confidence can grow too. So good advice. And Jamie has a question. Let me know if you're going to be covering mm -hmm. this because we can always come mm -hmm. back to it. But she says, Cody isn't a pandemic pup, but is weird around new people. After a year of little contact with new people, any suggestions for reintroducing dogs to meeting people out and about and having new people coming into the house again? That's a great question. Yes, yes that is a great question. And that's why it's one of my four topics that I'm going to be talking about. So All remedial right. socialization. So we, we will talk about that, Jamie. So, All right. I will so we'll that. hold off on questions until we get into it and then I can flash them up here for you. All right. So the things specifically what we're going to be covering tonight so that you guys have a sense of what we're going to go over. Uh, Laura is going to teach us how to help your dog cope with new stressors and define those stressors for you, how to make up lost socialization time, how to prevent problem behaviors while you work on them, and what to consider if your dog is struggling with home alone time. And I think that's one of the biggest ones right there. So I'm anxious to hear your mm -hmm. feedback on that too. So do we, do you want to jump in with the presentation yeah. right now? Can, okay. Yeah, let's so, jump in fix what I'm doing here. Okay. Presentation or video first? Let's do presentation first. Okay. Um, and then I'll probably do the video halfway through and then make it go back to the presentation again. Perfect. <laughs> okay. No problem. <laughs> um, and it's a relatively short one because I figured maybe there'll be a lot of questions. I want to make sure I let, leave time for those. So I, I won't overdo it with the slides here on you guys. Okay. So you can go ahead and go to the next one. It just kind of summarizes. Oh wait, that's me, isn't it? That's not you. Yeah. That's me. <laughs> you so, so you're doing it. I have the control. Um, okay. So this kind of just summarizes what you said. So um, the things we'll go over. So yeah, the new stressors and triggers that are out there, pre preventing some problems. And I might have said it a little bit differently than you just said it, but basically preventing more issues. So like, what can you do prevention wise to address um, any new issues that might come up? And ideas for remedial socialization. So that will be good for you, Jamie. Um, that will address your question for sure. And remedial socialization, meaning like, you know, again, maybe your dog was pretty social or things were going pretty well and something has happened. So it's almost your exact question. Um, and, you know, what can I do to either make up for lost time or what can I do to just be able to move forward and get some good momentum back? Um, and then the isolation, the alone time issues. And it's funny, I actually thought a lot of trainers, a lot of people in my field thought that um, the isolation, the alone time issues would become an issue. And it absolutely has but it has, I'm definitely seeing it. Um, but a lot of people, I would say, you know, not as many people, people that, how do I want to put this? People that um, thought they would be dealing with this issue, they've just sort of, it's sort of happened more naturally for them because they've sort of slowly transitioned back and their dogs are actually doing a little bit better than we expected. And, um, if anything, I'm seeing, I'm seeing, um, alone time issues with dogs who also have a lot of other triggers in their life. Like there are a lot of other stressors in their life. So they are the dogs who are also barking at all the other dogs that are walking down the street. And they're the dogs that are overreacting to people coming in the house and they're the dogs. So it's, I'm not like just seeing 
the isolation issues alone, I'm seeing it like as a big group of behaviors. So that tells me that these dogs are just so overwhelmed with everything going on, all the changes, that that's what they tend to be struggling with the most. So, but we will get into that, but it was just funny that I, I didn't see that alone. I just saw like, it's either they're dealing with so much stuff um, or they're not dealing with isolation stuff at all. Okay, so this is, I actually just sent this out by email to the people on my list today um, as um, your reactive dog's training path, but really this is your dog's training path in general. You can really sort of take this and apply it to almost any type of training. Um, so I did call it something different in for the purposes of this presentation, just your dog's training path. So, um, and this is kind of what we're gonna go through in the presentation to bits and pieces of it, which is why I'm starting with it now. So this breaks down the steps of, you know, moving forward in your training process. So like what are the actual stages you need to go through in order to get from point A to point B, you know, where to get from point A where you're completely just like my dog is really struggling. I don't know where to start. And then getting all the way to the end where you're like, oh, well, no, we got this. I feel good about this. So um, first stage, definitely understanding what's going on, knowing why your dog is struggling, you know, are they afraid of what's, what the trigger is? Are they super excited by the trigger? Um, and then how to see it coming, like being able to read their body language and being able to see, um, see the subtle signs that are there before they turn into big problems. Okay. So once you can get through that stage, you know, you don't have to know everything. And that's something I had said in the email too, like you don't, and in my blog post that is related to this, you do not have to know everything about, you don't have to understand everything in order to move on to stage two. That's really important to, to know too. Um, so then in stage two, prevention and management, setting up your environment to prevent practicing the behavior. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as a prevention piece to tonight's talk, but basically just, you know, what can you do to keep your dog from getting, for, to keep the behavior from getting worse in your dog, right? And how can you, you know, maybe insert some alternative behavior, some replacement behaviors that your dog could do instead of the problem behavior. And then stage three would be going into skill building at home. And this piece is super important. And this is what my video is gonna relate to a little bit in a second. Um, when you're trying to teach a skill, you have to do it in the lowest distraction environment that's out there, right? And if you're dealing with pandemic puppy <laughs> and your, your or, or pup, I should say, and your pup has been home, the lowest distracting environment is going to be at home. I mean, I've gotten just in the last week, multiple emails where people have said, um, and this is pretty typical, but where people have said, you know, um, so-and-so is, really great at home, listens really well at home. But as soon as I take her outside, she's just really distracted. Oh, and she's a hound. I'm like, it doesn't matter if she's a hound, she's a dog first. <laughs> and that is so normal for dogs. Um, but you have to think about like, what are the skills that you're actually gonna need for your specific dog and for the problems that you're having? Um, like if you see, if you have a dog who's reactive to other dogs and you see a dog on the street and you need to somehow walk by it or you need to at least get away from it, um, you're gonna maybe maybe need to turn around <clears throat> and go the other way. Does your dog know how to easily and quickly turn around and go the other way happily with you without worrying about what's over their shoulder behind them? Um, you might naturally, if you see another dog, so let's say same thing, dog-dog reactivity issue, if you see another dog and you are probably going to tighten up on the leash because that's human nature, I will tell you not to, it's still gonna happen, right? You're gonna tighten up on the leash, you might even hold your breath or you'll breathe a little faster, or you'll talk a little faster to your dog and you'll get, you'll start throwing out, spitting out words at them and this and that. And if the only time your dog ever feels that tension on the leash or feels you tightening or feels you, knows that you're holding your breath is when there's another dog, that's gonna become part of the problem. So you need to work on that at home, you know, be pra practicing walking around your yard and tightening up the leash, stuff like that. Um, and teaching them that it means something different. It doesn't mean that you need to like, be like, oop, who's out there? There's someone out there, you know? So then stage four would be quiet outdoor practice. So you wanna practice the skills in quiet outdoor spaces in your local area. This one people skip a lot because they don't really know where to go or what to do. And I definitely have been there <laughs> even recently with this particular dog Willow that you see there um, in the picture. Um, she is a reactive dog to other dogs. Um, I can't always trust her with other dogs and she has gotten a lot better 
but um, I have had to go out of my way to look for quiet spaces. And I'm actually gonna give you guys some ideas um, in a few minutes of maybe where you could go um, or what types of places you could look into. And then controlled outdoor distraction would be the next stage after that. So this is separate than the quiet outdoor practice, right? So now controlled outdoor distractions, you could get into small groups. Um, you could plan little field trips with your friends, stuff like that, where they have dogs, or maybe they don't, if it's not a dog dog issue, maybe it's just people, but you have a nice controlled setting. And the hardest part for people is they're like, well, yeah, I can take my dog out for a walk, but I can't control the person that's walking down the street. And that's so true. You can't. Um, even with, again, with Willow, I've had to think, and I have lots of dog trainer friends, right? And I've had to think, I'm like, hmm, which of my dog trainer friends have dogs that would be appropriate to practice with? I'm not really sure. So it's not easy, um, which is actually why I love the dog walking club, because you've got like an awesome resource right there to be able to, you know, reach out to people and create little groups. Um, and then stage six, your final stage and your longest stage, because you'd be doing this for a long time is real world practice. That's just getting out and about and doing the real stuff and, you know, not planning for the controlled distraction out there. And it might be that if your dog is struggling, it might be that you have to basket muzzle train them ahead of time. And so you can go out and about and with your dog in the basket muzzle and they're still safe just in case something big happens, but they can practice. Um, I had um, lots of instances recently where I've taken Willow out in her basket muzzle um, just to be able to get her out and about and see that like, oh, she can actually handle this environment way better than I thought she could. So that's been really nice to see. I love this training success path. That's that's really well laid out and it, it's clear the steps that you need to take in order to achieve success. Nice job. Yeah, thank you. I actually just made it yesterday because it I was like, you know what? This is told, this is every time I coach people, this is exactly the process that I take them through. So why don't I just lay it out in a visual way so that Makes everybody sense. else can understand what, what it is that I go through with people because you could you could do this on your own at home or you know you can certainly um, reach out to a trainer and get help, but you can kind of go through that process. Um, and it's nice to just kind of know what's ahead of you, like what's the next step going to be. Yeah. Um, okay, so then this is just a nice little graphic of just some of the more common triggers and stressors that people are dealing with now with the post pandemic stuff, you know, like or stuff that they haven't really, had to see or deal with too much in the last year or so, okay? Um, and I'm not gonna go through every single one, you guys are probably can tell what most of these are, but you know, just a few of them to point out, people coming to the door, ringing the doorbell, knocking on the door, okay? That probably wasn't happening very often. I know if I got food delivered, they would just leave it on the front steps. Ooh. Sometimes I would tell them to just leave it on the front steps and they would still knock, <laughs> but, um, but for the most part, like delivery people, they weren't, we weren't opening our doors for them very much anymore. We're kind of just letting them do their thing, right? So that's that's been a big thing. Obviously, you see the home alone dog up there. I put in some um, spring or summer like distractions because it's been a year, right? Like it's been a while. It was a long winter. Um, so fireworks are big stressors people are deal uh, dogs are dealing with right now. People too, maybe um, squirrels, chipmunks, stuff like that. Springtime stuff, um, thunderstorms. And those are those are triggers that get stacked on top of all these other stressors too. You don't might not think about them separately, but they all get stacked up. So like tomorrow, I know we're supposed to get some storms. So now if we get these storms, if your dog gets a little stressed about that, but also some of these other things happen, that's called trigger stacking. They might have a harder day, even the next day. Um, people riding bikes, you know, again, we're seeing that more often. People out with their dogs, kids. Um, Vet appointments, you weren't going into the vet very often. Now you might be going in more often, um, hopefully. And so you might be seeing that your dog is more or less stressed than you expected them to be. Um, barbecues, crowds, grandma reaching out. <laughs> like, yeah, I just, love that one. Trying just to what, pinch the cheese for me. Yeah. Just the dog. <laughs> Um, kids hovering like sports games. I've seen I, my kids are playing soccer now and I've seen a lot of people bringing their puppies and their young dogs to the soccer games. For the most part, I haven't seen too many issues, but there definitely have been some dogs where you can tell that they just they want nothing to do with that. Um, so that's something to consider. The dog in the kennel is just, you know, people starting to go on vacation. Where are they taking their dogs? They're either hiring you, Tracy, for pet sitting or they are sending them to kennels and they haven't been to a kennel 
you know, this entire pandemic. So right. maybe ever if they're young. So that's all stuff to think about. So these are common triggers just in general, no matter what pandemic, no pandemic, doesn't matter. But these are things that we really haven't been exposing our dogs to within the pandemic time. Okay. So these are, that's why I picked these ones. Um, and some dogs, like I got a dog yesterday, um, somebody contacted me because her dog just doesn't want to walk. Um, so that, that's a, actually a really common one too, for whatever reason. Um, either they weren't taking him out for very walks, the cars, there weren't as many cars. It wasn't as busy. People weren't out and about as much, who knows why, but, um, but that's been a pretty common one too. So I think I'm trying to remember what my next slide is. Yeah. Let's do the video next. Um, okay. I'll sort of break it up for you guys a little bit too. So let me pause it for one sec. I'll give you guys the backstory. So this is Miles. Miles is a boxer. Um, and Miles, his owner came to me. I've done all, all virtual with Miles up to this point. Um, and his owner came to me because he was, he didn't want to walk on the streets. He would be fine in the yard up to a certain point. The front yard he would struggle with. He'd only go about halfway up the driveway. Um, relatively quiet street. He'd be great in the backyard. And as they reported, they said that he would go for walks um, out beyond, like not on the street. He would go for um, trail walks, basically. And he seemed to be really excited on the way out, like really happy to go on the way out. But on the way back, he would panic and he would just want to get back to the car as fast as possible. So this is um, four or five, I think five different clips of different um, sessions. This this first one is going to be a walk that they took him on. And I'm going to point out a little bit of body language stuff. So this is on his way out on a walk when they had said that they thought like he's really excited. He's really into um, into his walk. And so he hasn't even turned around yet in this part of the walk. Okay. So let me play that. Okay. I want you guys look at his tail right here. Okay. So this is where, again, owner said he's excited. He's happy. His tail says otherwise. Okay. And then the other thing I'm going to point out is, and you might not be able to see because it's a quick clip, but he's very hyper vigilant. He is looking around like what's out there. What's going to, you know, what's going to pop out something, something could happen. So he looks like he's doing some nice leash walking. He looks like he's just hanging out with the owners, you know, doing exactly what we expect him to do. But from my perspective, what I'm seeing is a dog who's fearful, a dog who's hypervigilant, a dog who's tiptoeing because he doesn't want to get too far away from his owners because something might pop out at him. Okay. So this is a dog who we had to say no more trail walks right now. Okay. We have to go back to the house. You have to go back to where he's the most comfortable and we have to get him feeling better at home first. Okay. So let me play this a little bit more here. Okay, so then this is their first session. And again, what am I going to point out here? I'm going to point out his low tail. So what I'm having him do in this session is just walk around the backyard and just practice what's what I refer to as Disney World walking. It's just basically getting good things happen on your left side. Good things happen here. Okay, so the treats are happening. The the happy talk is happening, which I muted this video um, just for privacy purposes. But um, and the idea was here, just walk around your backyard because they said he's very comfortable in the backyard. So I said, OK, so let's start there. That's where he's the most comfortable outside. Right. We actually started in the house and then we took it to the backyard. Um, and then this is the video that they sent me because that's what I have people do when I do the private coaching is we do lots of videos back and forth. So which is beautiful because then I can see stuff like this that otherwise they might not have been able to tell me. Okay, so see that really low tail? He's looking up at her, but his tail is low. So I said, the first, your first job, our first job is to get that tail up. I want to see that tail up. Okay, this was one of the next sessions. See how nice and high that tail is now? Oh, yeah. But he's, he's still kind of just like he's walking around. He's doing this thing. Okay, so I said, speed up your walking. Make it peppy. Let's get some pep in his step. And then this is the next session. Okay, so I had her just speed up. Now she's in the front yard. This is where he gets very stressed out normally. And there, I'm going to go back a little bit. I guess I went too fast with these videos here. So this is the driveway here. Um, he normally won't go, wouldn't go that far up the driveway. He'd kind of stay by like maybe the brick walkway 
back towards the house. So this is much further in the driveway. So what I'm doing is I'm just having her move around the yard, but putting some pep in her step so that he gets bouncy and excited. I'm looking for that bounce. I want that boxer bounce. You know, boxers are meant to be leggy and bouncy and just goofy dogs. And I wasn't seeing any of that goofiness out of him. And I knew that he had it because I saw it in the house when we were doing some virtual stuff in there. So so I said, all right, our first job is to get his tail up. So we did that pretty quickly. I mean, as long back and forth, back and forth, did that. Um, second job is to keep that tail up in the front yard. Okay. So this is walking through that path that I showed you in the beginning where it's like, you understand what's going on. You set up management protocols. So leashes, um, you know, where you're going to work with them in the house, stuff like that. And then you're going to work inside the house and in the backyard where he's comfortable. And then you're going to be moving to the more, um, the places that are a bit more of a struggle, which the front yard was still a struggle. So that's why we worked there. So here you'll see the bounce and he's afraid of cars. So right there, a car um, drove by just, you, you couldn't see it in the video, but you could hear it. Um, and so he stopped, but right after that, Look at that happy bounce. I was so excited to see nice. that. Nice. So, <laughs> um, so that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the path. You can go back to the presentation if you want, Tracy, um, while I'm chatting. But when I'm talking about the path, that's where you really want to you know, break it down like that because that's so important. So whenever you're dealing with these triggers, these stressors, you need to break it down like this because if you don't, if you skip those steps, you're going to have that tail down still. You're going to have the hypervigilant dog, you know, those walks. And what was happening out on walks is it's not just that his tail was down like boohoo, no big deal. It's that his tail was down. But the big issue was he was very reactive to other dogs. If he saw another dog on a walk or a person on the walk or a bike on a walk, he was exploding at them Ooh. because he was already so tense that he just couldn't handle one more thing. Right. So, yeah. um, but they thought, so they thought the issue was, Oh, he's, he's doing this with other dogs. He's barking at other dogs. He's lunging on his leash, stuff like that. But I said, we have to back this up a little bit. We have to address the underlying emotion before we can really address that other stuff. So, um, so we are probably, I would say between stages three and four at this point with him. Um, so pretty soon we're going to be doing some more controlled stuff um, out and about with him. So Laura, how long has it taken you to get from stage one to stage four through those videos and the practice with those folks? Um, I would say it's about, they signed up for six sessions to start with. I think we've done five sessions. Okay. So I would say about, but I, it was every week and then we ended up spacing it out a little bit. So I would say it's probably been about a month and a half, maybe two months at most. So, I mean, do you have any theories in regards to how long it might take us to kind of retrain our dogs to be comfortable in a social setting? It's It sort of depends on how much experience they had before, um, you know, and if you can slow it down enough, basically think of it kind of like we did in the pandemic, slow down to speed up. <laughs> like anybody who's in business during the pandemic, like me, um, it was, I had to slow down everything in order to make some good progress. So that's basically yeah. what you're going to be doing with your dog too. So if you can slow it down and bring it back to the basics just for a short period of time, a lot of times you can make much better momentum that way. Cause again, we're trying to address that underlying emotional state for your dog. If we can get them feeling good, then everything else that follows is going to be way easier for them. If they're already stressed out about stuff that anything else that follows there, it's just going to be one more stressor for them. So that is super important, but timeline wise, it's hard to say. It depends on how well your dog copes with the stressors, what their learning curve is like in general. Some dogs need to go on medications because like I have a Newfoundland I'm working with right now virtually. And I did recommend that she reach out to her veterinarian to talk about medication because she just, she was making progress, but she just needed that extra little something to help her cope. And ever since she went on the medication, her progress has been so much faster now. Like every time oh. I talk to her, she's like, Oh, she did this and this. And, you know, so could it be a training? It could be, but do I want to give some credit to the medication? Absolutely. Even though it's only been a couple of weeks, I still want to give some credit to the meds because mm. I, she was just, she was a little bit stuck still and, and having trouble coping. So her learning curve is faster now. And I think that's where the medication has been really helpful. Um, all right. So we'll skip that. 
So, um, and we'll go back to questions about that sort of stuff too, but I'll get you guys through the, the slides. But if there's any questions specifically that come up, don't, don't hesitate to interrupt either. All right. um, so distance socialization. So this is that like, okay, well, where can I go with my dog where it's relatively quiet, <laughs> but um, you know, it's distracting enough. So a couple of things, um, ball fields, especially before school fully gets out, if you can get to that piece now and you can go out and practice now with like during school hours, I have found just locally in New Hampshire anyways, I have found tons of just open like ball fields that are that are dog, dog on leash friendly. So I can't promise you that they're off leash dog friendly, but on leash, which is what you'd be wanting to do anyways, because that's what you would be doing when you go for a walk or when you're, you know, doing this and that out there. Um, on leash. So I found multiple ball fields just, and I've really only been looking in my very local area. So I know that they're everywhere. Um, and playgrounds often have a lot of green space around them. And um, in my blog post that I just did that I will link, link for you guys after this and make sure I add it in the comments. Um, I give really specific um, recommendations, not like specific locations, but more specific recommendations as far as like times when you should use these spaces, these places. But like with playgrounds, some people would say, well, what if my dog's afraid of kids? You know, I don't want to put kids at risk. But what I will say about the playground, number one, don't put anybody at risk. Okay. So use lots and lots of space. And again, basket muzzle if you think there's any risk of anything. But what I will say about playgrounds is typically the dog, the kid, the kids, not the dogs, the kids are engaged with the playground. So they're much less likely because they're at the playground, they're much less likely to then come running up to you and your dog because they have something else to do. Um, as opposed to just like an open park area where there might not be that much going on and they see a dog, they're like, oh, a dog's over there, I have to go say hi. And they go rogue and they just run away from their parents and go running up to you, right? So, um, but that's where you have to be a little mm -hmm. bit more hyper vigilant and just be aware of who is where and, you know, it, that kid keeps running off randomly. Maybe I should stay away from that particular kid, stuff like that. So, but obviously safety first. And then um, I put the, one of the pictures of the New Hampshire, of the dog walking club, one of our outings that we had training outings um, where we were doing a small group. It was very controlled. Um, if these were all reactive dogs, I would have said lots more space in between everybody, please. But, um, but in this case, they weren't reactive dogs. We were just working on recall stuff, but it was just nice. Um, example of it. Um, some other things, you know, like there's a lot of 5Ks going on right now. You know that there are going to be a lot of people around. Often there's a lot of open space in those areas too. If your dog is ready for that type of situation, that can be another place where you know you're going to see people at a distance. Um, parking lots, Home Depot, Lowe's type parking lots, stuff like that, because those are nice big parking lots. You know people are going to get out of their car. They're going to go into the store. They're going to come out of the store. They're going to go back to their car. <laughs> um, so you know you can kind of control what the people are going to do. So places yeah. like that are also very good. So um, certainly, you know, you can post any ideas that you have. But I find that those tend to be my my few go-to places. Um, also dog parks, but outside. Let me make this very clear. Outside the dog park. Okay, not in the dog park. But usually there's a lot of green space also outside the dog park. So you know that there are going to be dogs in the park. So if your dog has issues with other dogs and you want to get some practice, if your dog is ready for it and you're at a good enough distance, a lot of times that's a nice way to do it too because they can be practicing looking at the other dogs and not reacting to them. Okay. Um, all right. So those are some ideas for that. All right. So then prevention and replacement behaviors. Um, so if you're going to prevent behaviors from happening, the best way to do that is to have replacement behaviors for them, you know? So like, instead of doing this, do that. Um, so if you, if your dog is one who, let me give you one of the better examples here. Um, uh, begging for food or even, I did use this example in there, but like if you say you have a dog in the case of reactive dogs, say you have a dog who barks at the window because somebody's out there, right? And here I put it for the begging for food one. You could teach them to go to bed go to their place instead. And if their go to place or go to bed behavior is really strong, you can have them do that for happy rewards instead of barking at the thing that's out the window, right? Um, so 
a lot of prevention stuff can be accomplished through replacement behavior. So this is just a very simple, relatively simple list, um, but of just examples of replacement behaviors that you can teach your dog. So instead of that, why don't you do this? And then you can reinforce the behavior that you do want much more often and get some good reinforcement history in there. And then they're gonna be less likely to do the other stuff. So by preventing, by replacing the behaviors, you are preventing those behaviors from getting worse and worse and worse because they've been practicing them, practicing them because practice does make perfect. They will get better if they continue to practice. And it also can become very self-reinforcing behavior. So think of like the classic mailman or UPS syndrome that dogs have where the mailman comes, drops off the package, dog barks like crazy, mailman goes away, in case you haven't heard of this. And all of a sudden the dog's like, woo, I did that. <laughs> um, you know, little did they know that Mamo was going to go away anyway. So what if you got them to go to their bed or you got them to do nice hand targeting or something like that instead of barking at the mailman and the mailman still goes away? That would be like magic to them, right? They'd be like, oh, I did that too, but I did it in a different way. So, um, so it's just sort of replacing, again, replacing these behaviors and just making it so, okay, well, what behavior would I like to see instead? So having a plan for that is very important. Um, all right. So I will get into, I'm just going to go through some basic do's and don'ts of separation anxiety and isolation stuff. And then if people have questions about them, um, that might be a good place for me to answer them. These are the last couple of slides too. So separation anxiety is a huge thing. I mean, separation anxiety is basically, it's a panic it's a panic attack, it's anxiety attack. So um, it is very distressful for everybody, dogs and the people involved. And there are a lot of misconceptions out there about separation anxiety. So this is just kind of a basic list of do's and don'ts, but there's a lot more that goes into it as well. Okay, so if you think you're actually, if your dog actually has separation anxiety, you have to work whether you want to or not if you think it's true separation anxiety, there's so much intri intricacy. Is that a word? That sounds like a word. There's a word. <laughs> yeah, okay. It, I questioned it for a second. There's so many little details that go into it. And there's so much science that if you truly think your dog has separation anxiety, I really encourage you to reach out to somebody. There are separation anxiety certified trainers. They're called CSATs, C-S-A-T. Um, certified separation anxiety trainers is basically what it stands for. And um, they focus on just that, but definitely reach out. I mean, I do lots of separation anxiety too, but I'm not necessarily certified in it. Um, but the people who are certified, they're up, they know all the new science and all that. So um, I definitely encourage you to reach out to somebody, even if it's your veterinarian, if you think that this is the case, okay? But if you're thinking it's just like, my dog has some isolation stuff, you know, you could kind of start to play around with it in that case, okay? Um, and I do also, I am running a challenge right now in my membership on isolation issues and separation skills, and that will become a course after that. So if that's something that you do want to work on and you're not overly concerned about it, um, that might be something to think about too because it's definitely a good virtual type thing to work on. Mm. Um, all right, so do start with short absences and build up staying below the stress threshold. The biggest mistake people make is they say like, okay, I'm gonna work on it this weekend. And then Monday though, I have to go to work. And then all of a sudden their dog gets really stressed out again because they've been gone for more than two minutes. And now you've sort of undone all of your hard work. So the most important thing, and this is one of the top skills that you learn when you do work with true separation anxiety, is you have to work below that stress threshold. And unfortunately, the number one thing people don't want to hear, but I have to say it, unfortunately, you cannot leave your dog alone for any period of time when they would be stressed out. So if that's two minutes, if that's one hour, if that's three hours, it doesn't matter. If you get your dog to that point where they become stressed and they have that panic attack, you've just undone all of your work. So that means you have to have a great community around you. Um, you have to have a support system. You have to have people who are willing to hang out with your dog for a little while. Um, it's amazing how creative people can get, especially now we've been through the pandemic with, you know, like working from home for a little while or trading off with people or, you know, hiring a dog walker to come and literally just hang out with the dog. Maybe not even walk the dog, but just hang out with the dog. Um, yeah. 
stuff like that. So you do have to have a village around you, which is super important. And for your own stress, because it's very stressful to deal with, but also for your dog's stress. Um, do provide ex exercise and enrichment through chew toys, training and treat toys. So exercise is not the cure for separation anxiety. It actually will not affect it all that much if it's true anxiety, but you still do want to make sure your dog is exercised and the mind is enriched enough, um, to at least make sure that that's not the problem that's going on. Um, do use a trusted pet sitter, daycare, family friend when you're away. So you don't, undo all your hard work, like I said, and then do talk to your veterinarian professional trainer for dog struggles with being left alone, which is what I preached about in the very beginning there. So I went backwards. Um, and don't, advised. don't, it's, it's sometimes advice that does not want to be heard, but it's very important. Um, don't scold or punish your dog for anything he did while you were gone. He was having a panic attack. So if you come home to a ripped up couch or blinds that are torn down or a hole in your floor. Unfortunately, if it was true at separation anxiety, they were just having a panic attack and anything you do or say, if you actually add more stress to the situation, it could actually make the, make the issue worse because now they're stressed about you coming home too. Um, so you have to be very careful about that. Don't increase your dog's fear by using any tools that would be scary or painful. Um, this is not the place for shock collars, citronella collars, any sort of anti-bark collars, anything like that. It will just compound the problem. It will make them feel stressed about just being, existing mm -hmm. <laughs> on top of, you know, you not being there. Um, don't leave your dog in the crate if he hasn't already learned to love his crate when you're home. This is another big misconception. People think like, my dog has separation anxiety. He has to be in the crate. Some dogs do a hundred times better when they're just left free in the house and you just make sure that everything is secure and you have a camera to keep an eye on them. Okay. Cameras are huge too. Um, but some dogs just, they truly don't like that, that feeling of being stuck somewhere small. So they, they, um, they are a lot worse in there than if they were free or even an exercise pen that you have, like, you know, you have an area for them that they're, where they're more comfortable. Don't blame yourself. You didn't cause this. You did not over, bond with your dog. You did not over love your dog. You did not cuddle with your dog too much. Invite them up on the couch too much. You cannot cause separation anxiety. It is genetic. It is, um, can be a little bit learned, but not really. It's mostly more genetic. And, um, so this is not your fault. You did not cause this at all. And don't expect your dog to just get over it. He needs your help with it. Okay. They need, they need assistance from us when they're dealing with this type of problem. Okay. All right, that is my slideshow spiel. Good stuff. I like it. We've got lots of comments and questions. Want to jump to it? Oh, good. Yes. All right. Let's jump Let me in. take this out here of the stream. Let's see here. I'm just going to go back to Jamie's question just to make sure that we answered it completely. So, suggestions for yep. reintroducing dogs to meeting people out and about and having new people coming into the house again. So, Jamie, I would um, I'd be looking at sort of more open spaces. So you could use um, your yard area as sort of your open space instead of bringing people in. So whenever I have anybody come into the house in general, I always have the people and some dogs this doesn't work for, but the majority of dogs it does work better for. And we might've even done it with him a long time ago. I will have the people come in the house first before I bring the dog in the house. Um, or I'll have the people in the yard first before I bring the dog out. So I have the people existing in the space first before the dog comes in. So technically the dog is the intruder, even though it's their yard or their home or whatever it is, that can make a big difference. But another thing is making sure that people understand, please don't try to pet my dog. He'll come up to you if he's comfortable. Um, you need to be able to watch the body language because if his back legs are way behind him and he's stretching his neck out because he wants that treat that that stranger is offering, you almost think of it, it's terrible example, but almost like taking candy from a stranger. You know, like it's like the stranger in the car who's like, here, kid, come take some candy. That's what it's like for dogs when they're like stretching their neck out and their feet are way behind them. It's like they're tempted there's that temptation there. They want it. They want, they want the food, but they normally wouldn't get that close to the stranger. So if you see that out of your dog, your dog is, it's, they're not ready for that sort of interaction. That's where they can tend to make a bad choice. Um, so making sure you have a plan for how your dog is going to greet people or not greet people and make sure that 
Cody knows how to be by himself too, just in case you're like, you know what? It's getting a little too crazy. <laughs> it's getting too late at night. You know, there the drinks are coming out or whatever it is. And you're kind of like, it's just, it's too much for Cody right now. Um, so he needs to be able to hang out by himself. So teaching your dog how to understand that alone time, isolation time is a good thing in some cases can be really helpful too. Um, but, and um, so yeah, I would, I would focus on without giving you too much here. I'd focus on greetings, you know, how you're going to handle them or not handle them management, what kind of management you can have in place for him. Um, and maybe like that, the take a peek game, which I have taught about. And I know I have lots of videos in the club about that too. Um, and I can always link to that if you guys need to see them again or can't find them. Um, but those are really good too, for getting your dog used to those specific triggers. Okay, yeah, so all great that helps. Thank you for your question, Jamie. Mm -hmm. So Michelle has a question as well in regards to socialization. So she wants to take Brutus to one of the New Hampshire Dog Walking Club walks, but she's nervous. She's been taking Ruby to check out the trails in advance to see if it is a good fit for Brutus. What do you suggest to get him acclimated to other dogs before I take him with the club? I do take him to public areas, but I'm very picky about what those spaces are. So... One thing that I think would be a good, and I've thought about this for some of my clients too, um, or my members, because they're kind of in that same boat, some of the early members, because they've been working on it for a while. Um, you know, some of the walks, and I know, Tracy, you usually post, um, you know, a rating system for, you know, what the trails are actually like and all that. Right. And I know some of them have open spaces and some of them are a little bit more, you know, cramped and condensed. I think, Michelle, if it's not too much of a hassle for you, it's too much out of your way, if you get some of the more local walks and you can even work with Brutus, maybe not even necessarily joining the walk officially, but you can, you know where the walk is happening, you know what's going on and you just say like, Tracy, do you mind if I just come and like hang out at a distance with him and just work with him in that general vicinity where there are other dogs because she's going to know or Michelle, you're going to know in that case, okay, I know there are going to be other dogs and people there. And, um, and you're going to be able to predict like where they're going to be exactly. So um, doing something like that can be really helpful. So you don't actually go on the trail itself, but you kind of just use that, that beginning and end piece to it. Um, and, you know, muzzle training again, really helpful. And I'm pretty, I know that I'm, 99% sure that you have muzzle trained Brutus, if I remember correctly. Um, but I think just picking and choosing the right walks and locations is going to be really huge. And then not being ashamed to say like, you know what, we've tried it. It's just, he's, I can tell he's not doing well today. We're going to call it early because there's absolutely no shame in that. And I think people That's feel, cool. they feel like once they're there, they're like, oh no, and I'm stuck. People are right. gonna ju judge me for turning around and leaving, but you're there for your dog. The whole point of going on these walks is to be bonding and be you know, doing this stuff with your dog. So if it's not gonna be good for your dog, ultimately you have to be willing to say like, you know what, today's just not the day, but we tried and we're gonna try again later and maybe back it up a little bit um, and try to get together with smaller groups, stuff like that. Um, I know like in my membership now, we're starting to do some local field trips. And my idea for the field trips is to take the stuff that people have learned to do at home and now take um, some of the people, like three to four dogs, and we go to these different locations and we work on just on leash dog see dog stuff. So there's no interaction between the dogs whatsoever. They're at a distance. I only pick and choose places that have enough space. They're at a distance. We're going to work on those particular skills. But then what I'm going to tell them, actually, because it's all local, is your next stage, if you want to move up from this when your dog is ready, is I want you to go check out the dog walking club. So that's going to work out really well because it's like this transition between you're doing it at home. Now we're doing it with a trainer, really controlled, really like open space. You're not going for a walk on the trail. We're just working around other dogs, seeing how your dog handles it. And then next stage would be something like an actual dog walk um, in certain spaces. So hopefully. Yeah. And I'm glad you bring that up in regards to kind of hanging out in the back of, of some of the events that we run, because people do that all the time. There's absolutely mm -hmm. no shame in that, but it is a great testing ground because there's a lot of dogs there. Well, the majority of the dogs that come are um, rescues. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of history that's not known and there is a lot of reactive behavior but it is interesting that we see the dogs 
react very differently when they're all walking in the same direction. They're all pointed in one direction. They all have that same job to do. So it really is a great testing ground. So I'm glad Laura brought that up. All right. Well, thank you, Michelle, for that question. We appreciate that. Let's see. We've got a couple comments here, too. So uh, I know this is Sarah. She says, I like that plan of distant socialization. Izzy is fine in her backyard, but then neighborhood walks can be a bit insane and too much of a step up. Yeah, so that's where those those small group, like those controlled settings really help. So I would say um, at that stage that you're at, so find in the backyard, it's too much of a jump to do like a neighborhood walk. So yeah, I would say finding a park, finding something like that where you can just work with her under some distraction. She'll see people at a distance. She might see some dogs at a distance, stuff like that. Um, but even if she doesn't see any, it's still really good to be like, can I get my dog's attention? just when there are all these new smells around and all that. So you practice out at places like that. And then if you can find a small group to kind of like the field trip thing I was just talking about or join the membership and then you can join us. But <laughs> if you don't have that, but if you can find a small group of people and you can just, you know, meet in an open space like that, um, then that would be kind of in the next stage before trying the neighborhood walks because neighborhood walks, you don't know when dogs are going to come running out. You don't know when they're going to be off leash, but have a plan just in case. Um, and you know, it's their neighborhood. So it's kind of like the dogs get a little bit more amped up because it's familiar to them, maybe a little territorial stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, I think you got to break it down and you have a couple of other smaller stages in between where she's at now and the neighborhood walks where they're very uncontrolled. So those are like the, the stage sixes, the neighborhood walks, whereas you need to do stages four and five first, ideally. And we're coming up on an hour, Laura. We've still got several comments and questions. Do you have a hard stop or are you nope. good to go a little longer? Okay. Good to go. And also just to let people know, we have some great comments coming in and I appreciate it. I just want to reflect back on the uh, giveaway that Laura is doing because we did specifically say it was for questions. So I did want to just clarify because I want you to be included if that is something that you want to be included in that random drawing we'll do at the end. But if you have a question or you have a comment, try to phrase your comment as a question. Maybe next time what we'll do, Laura, is we'll say comments and questions. Yeah. But since that is what we said, it has to be a question. So I just wanted to- You guys can come up with something. Again. I know it. I know <laughs> you can come up. <laughs> well, just a quick PSA from Allison at Mary's Dogs. Pay attention, Mary's mm -hmm. Dogs Adopters. Laura is fabulous and an incredible resource. Thank and you, I Allison. I will second that as well. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Thanks for that, Allison. Okay, and let's see. So Sherry says, uh, my dog has been attacked three times. We moved from a rural setting to a community park. She loves people and kids. Now she is anxious when seeing other dogs. She will see them looking out the window and react. Oh, poor thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, who can blame her, right? If she's been attacked three times. Um, so yeah. So I would say you want to, again, go through those stages and, um, and I, like I said, I'll give you, I'll give you guys the link to the um, blog post too, so you can actually see the stages right in front of you whenever you need to. But um, first, you know, understanding. I mean, I think you probably have a basic understanding of why she's all of a sudden reactive to other dogs. So definitely understanding that um, and being able to read her body language. So if she sees another dog before she starts barking and going crazy and reacting, you know, do you see a little twitch of the tail? Do you, you know, just knowing the body language pieces. Um, and I do have a free training on body language stuff too, that I can always link up. Um, it's kind of basic. It's like one oh, body language 101, but it might be a place to start lip licking, yawning, stuff like that. Things people don't know about. Um, and then, you know, preventing the barking at the window. So if she sees another dog and she's barking at the window, are there things that you can be doing to prevent her from being able to get to the window at those times, whether it's a leash, whether it's blocking the window in some way, removing the couch that could be right in front of it, that's giving her easy access to it. Um, or, you know, teaching her alternative behaviors, or replacement behaviors, like we talked about, um, stuff like that. And then starting to work on thinking about like, okay, well, what are the skills that she's going to need in order to be able to handle dogs when we're out and about? She's going to need to be able to look at the dog and not react. So just being able to take a peek at the dog, that's my take a peek game. Um, she's going to need to be able to respond to her name when you say it. She's going to need to be able to um, probably do like a basic sit 
or wait or stay or something like that that just where she can kind of like trust that okay you got this <laughs> so if you were to step in front of her out on the walk and she can kind of just sit stay and let the other dog go by that could be something um and then basic leash walking skills like she's got to have the basics because if she's pulling on leash when there's no dog around then she definitely will do it when there are dogs around so thinking about stuff like that um and then those pieces where you're practicing at home and then the quiet open area and then the busier area but controlled and then the real life stuff so um, but just kind of breaking it down into those pieces so that you're not skipping stages too much. And I know it's not easy because some people want to say, but I just want to take my dog for a walk. But think of all your walks as training walks. Mm -hmm. And you, sometimes it takes an extra few minutes to pop in the car, even popping in the car and going like to the next road over and just walking a little small loop. If it's a quieter road, that can be a huge, make a huge difference for dogs mm -hmm. as opposed to going out their own door where they're already on edge, already worked up. So, Perfect. Sure. so Rhonda is wondering, are there breeds that are more prone to separation anxiety? Not necessarily. There are some dogs that are more prone to anxiety in general, some breeds. Um, usually the smarter the dog, the more prone they are to anxiety. <laughs> so some of this, what they're considered the smarter breeds can be more prone to it. Um, dogs who are, there are some genetic predispositions as far as you know, dogs who like herding breeds, for example, they like to maintain control in their environment. So if one person is out of place because they're not home, that takes away that sense of control for the dog. So I would say I do see a lot of herding breeds, a lot of herding breed mixes who do have some issues with that. They're also are very smart dogs, typically, um, like the Border Collies, the Australian Shepherds, cattle dogs, stuff like that. Uh, very intelligent. So they've got that working against them as far as anxiety goes because they're overthinking everything. And again, they want to maintain all sense of control. They need everybody in their place at all times, unless they say otherwise. Um, I would say rescue dogs, you know, they've done studies and they don't know if rescue dogs are more prone to it because of their um, their experiences being like bounced around a bit more, their lack of socialization early on, like if they're from, if they're Southern dogs. Um, but there are just as many purebred dogs from breeders as there are rescue dogs, but they do tend to find that um, rescue dogs who have been, I can't remember exactly what the study said now that I'm thinking of it, but um, I can't remember what the statistics are, but it's a little heavier on the rescue dog side, but they just don't know what the actual reason is, if it has anything to do with the actual breeds or if it's more the experiences versus the purebred. But um, separation anxiety is very genetic. Like there's a lot of genetic um, components to it. So it can absolutely be on the line of purebred dogs as well. So. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Christine says, love the example of the kid accepting right. candy from a stranger. Yeah. That was a good one. You always have good examples like that. Yeah. You'll have a nice visual now, Christine, if you <laughs> think of that in the future of like anytime somebody goes to offer your dog a treat, if their legs are way back there, it's like, you can just see that that stranger in the car offering kids the candy. <laughs> exactly. So, And Michelle says, yes, Brutus is muzzle trained. I love that idea. Yep. Yes. Perfect. And I guess just a side note too, because you said muzzle training, and I think it's important people know that it is a process. And oh, yes. It, I, I think yes. you have some examples too. Is I know because you didn't mention that you're fear-free certified, and I yes. kind of see muzzle training with a fear-free process. Would you agree? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, bas it's a basket muzzle. Um, never a muzzle that holds their mouth shut. It's always a muzzle that where they can fully pant. And actually you want to make sure like if they could hold a tennis ball in their mouth, it typically fits them. Okay. Um, but that's how much space they need to have for panting. So it has to be sized properly or your dog will hate it because it will just press on their, their mouth too much. It'll, um, inhibit their panting and all that. They can't wear it long term that way. But yeah, I mean to have something put on their face and then they can't, they can't eat the grass when they want to, or they can't like pick up the sticks and, you know, so there are some downsides to it for them, but if you keep them engaged in stuff and you follow the process of getting them used to it, making them realize the muzzle is a good thing. Basically with, with Willow, when I muzzle trained her, she thought that the muzzle itself was like a peanut butter dispenser because she would just stick her nose in to lick the peanut butter off of there. <laughs> um, and she was pretty sure it was just like an open bowl of peanut butter for a long time. So, um, and so there are, you know, dogs aren't stupid. They get it. They understand that it's limiting to them. But if you make it 
as positive as you possibly can and you keep them pretty busy during it, you know, take them on walks in the muzzle and you make it a regular thing. So it's not just, oh, you have to have the muzzle on only when there's going to be another dog and then the other dog stresses them out and all of a sudden there's stressors everywhere. Um, Or, you know, you take them to the vet and the vet's the one that puts the muzzle on. That's the worst in my opinion because number one, it's not sized to them. And number two, they're already really stressed out about being at the vet's office, whether, you know, they seem happy or not. I can tell you from working inside a vet's office, they're almost always stressed to some degree. Um, And so to then have to get a muzzle on them at that point. So muzzle train, I mean, every dog really should be muzzle trained in my opinion, but it's a hard sell, Um, but it's changing. People are starting, they're coming out with like pink muzzles, purple muzzles, rainbow muzzles, multicolors. They're trying to make them so that they don't have such a stigma behind them. But yes, there is a process um, in, do they look like Hannibal Lecter sometimes? Sure, Um, but you gotta see past the muzzle and see that if your dog is muzzle trained well, I mean, they have so much more freedom to be able to go out and about in all these different places because you can feel more confident about having some sense of um, control if somebody makes a mistake. Usually it's the human that makes a mistake, but um, the dog is the one with the teeth. So we have to, you know, unfortunately they have to be the ones who are muzzled. Um, we can't do too much to the people, so. Yeah. That's a conversation for another day. Yes, yeah, so I could go I could go up for the whole thing about that one. <laughs> yep. All right. So uh Sarah says, How would you approach aggression towards workers coming in the house like a plumber? Izzy gets really protective. This is probably a really big question. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people yeah. struggle with that. Yeah, it's a big question, but it it kind of similar to like the stages I was talking about before, where you know, um, why is she aggressing towards the workers in the house? Is it um, something that they're wearing? Is it the way that they come in with a presence? Is it um, their smell? (laughs) Um, Is it, you know, so like, why is it happening? Is she afraid of them or is she, is there some reinforcement in it? So understanding that piece of it is important first. Um, Again, you don't have to understand it 100%, but you have to just have some basic understanding and be able to know her body language. But then next stage, management. So again, making, and I know Izzy struggles with some alone time stuff in general, but um, this is a time when if a worker's coming in the house, ideally the dog should just be crated or in a room hanging out or with you hanging out or kept busy somewhere else or sent to a friend's house or something like that, just depending on the type of work that's being done. Because to, to have them deal with the worker when the worker's trying to do the job and they're not there to see the dog. And a lot of them do actually love dogs, but they don't love dogs in the way that we need them to love dogs in the moment. Um, So honestly, I usually say with workers coming in the house, management is the absolute best piece of it because they can't necessarily work with you in that case. They're there, they do a job, and it's usually a pretty temporary job. So setting up some good management protocol is usually the best way to deal with workers specifically. So hopefully that helps. But certainly, you know, if you find that, like reach out again, if you find that it's something that, you know, happens on a regular basis to the point where just management isn't going to quite cut it. And then we could kind of go through the stages that way. But I would, I would say to make your life easier, I'd focus more on the management prevention piece of it. Chris wants to know, uh, my dog is eating the stairs and bored every time that she's alone to decrease the anxiety. Oh, wait. Every time that she's alone to de- decrease the anxiety, another dog can help? Question mark. I think you turned it into a question. Good job. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> um, I would not get another dog just to help with that. <laughs> um, I think it's too risky. I think it's too because typically with separation anxiety, they are over attached to one or two beings in the house. It could be people, it could be dogs. Getting another dog may or may not help, uh, but then you've got to, you have another dog, which if then if you have multiple dogs, you have more than it's, I, that's a whole spiel too. It's like when you have two dogs, you really have three dogs because you have the individual dogs and you have the compound dog <laughs> and, and so on and so on with the numbers. But, um, The main thing to think of is it may not help. There's a really good chance it won't help actually. Um, And if that dog has to go somewhere at some point, has to go to the vet's office or something happens to the dog or, you know, for whatever reason, the dog has to be separated from your dog, you're right back to square one again. 
or if the dogs don't get along for some reason. So there's just so many risks. I wouldn't necessarily go out and get another dog just for that reason. Could you try fostering a dog? Maybe you could see how that goes. Um, but keeping in mind that usually when you're fostering a dog, you want to foster them until they're adopted. So you're not fostering just to try them out usually. Um, could you, you know, like get together with another dog friend and see how that goes, see if that makes any difference first. That's stuff that you certainly could try first. And if you do find that it makes a big difference, then maybe it's something you could consider um, when you take all the other risks, risks into consideration as far as like, is the final dog you get gonna get along with your dog? And is it gonna be the ultimate um, solution? And what happens then if you have to separate those two dogs for health reasons or whatever? then you're gonna be right back to square one again. So really you wanna kind of deal with the separation anxiety from the bottom up um, and by addressing the emotional the emotional stuff first. Yeah, and I really like that question, Chris. Thanks for asking it because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people would think, you know, having a buddy, having a friend might mm -hmm. help. So um, that was a great question. Uh, let's see, I think this is Tracy Tuttle. Let me know if you think. Um, it says, hi, Laura, do you think a long line in the backyard would help with echo? Uh, he barks at dogs walking by. He's out alone, and I go out when he barks, but it takes a while for me to get him to come to me. And, Tracy, if this is you, please comment. It's just not letting us see your name because you haven't given StreamYard permission for us to see you, and I want to enter you in the drawing. So just uh, comment if it is you. Yeah, um, I absolutely think a long line would help because you need a way to be able to follow through on the barking. So if, the, if he's ignoring you, if he's blowing you off when he's barking because he's like, ah. I'm busy doing this, um, then yeah, you definitely need a way to be able to follow through. And, you know, so if you call him to come to you um, and he doesn't, then you can go over and you can get the long line. The long line could be 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet, just depending on your yard and setup and all that. Um, and then you can follow through that way and you could even reel him in halfway and then ask him again to come to you. And if he does, then you have a chance to reinforce that actually, which is hard for people because they're kind of like, wait, but he didn't really listen, but reinforce it. And what you're going to find is he's like, oh, maybe it is worth it. Um, and he'll start coming more often that way. Even if in the moment you were kind of like, oh, but I had to go out and get you, you know, um, and then from there, when there are not any other dogs around, that's where you really are practicing those skills that you're going to need um, to be able to do it around other dogs. And again, I go back to like my take a peek game and getting him used to, OK, well, are there other things I should be doing when I see a dog instead of barking at them to try to make them go away? Um, there definitely are some other skills that you could be building on in the meantime when there are no other dogs right there so that you're not trying to do all of that hard stuff all at once. Yeah. Th thanks, Tracy, for asking that question. I know Tracy was at our recall training earlier this month at Livingston Park in Manchester, and, and you were working with her and Echo as well. So mm -hmm. it's important that she's got there. Okay, so Nancy asks, uh, would it help to have a person toss a cookie to your pup rather than try to give them a treat by hand if your dog is showing the candy from a stranger stance? That's sticking with people, Laura. It's I love sticking. that. <laughs> love it. Um, yeah, so I play a game called Treat Retreat, and it's not a game I invented. It's a game that's been out there for a little while. Um, and Treat Retreat is basically you have the person take a cookie and you toss it. they toss it past the dog. And then what will happen is the dog will – move away from that person to go get the treat. And then if they're comfortable enough, they will choose to come closer. So instead of being lured in for the treat, they're gonna actually come closer when there's no real treat luring them. And then in order to get the food, they actually go further away. So it's like they're getting more comfortable when they're eating and they're choosing to come closer on their own. And then if they do, oh, here's another treat. And then what you can do is slowly they're getting closer and closer that way. So that's one of my favorite games to play. Um, with dogs and then you know once they get to the point where their feet are like parallel with each other their back legs and their front legs are parallel with each other and they're taking the treat from the person the dogs are telling me they're a bit more comfortable that way the reason why i don't have people lure them in and i don't want people treating dogs when their back legs are like way behind them and they're ready to run is because the dogs are in a state of conflict they're like oh I, again just like the candy from the stranger i want that food but I wouldn't normally get that close to you. And then what happens, they're in that state of conflict and then the food's gone and maybe that person makes a quick move and then the dog makes a poor choice to bite or to even run away. Um, and then 
well, the biting is obvious. That wouldn't be good. But even the running away, it's that conflict state of like, I want it, but I don't, but I want it, but I don't. And we don't want our dogs in that conflict state. We don't want their brain going there. We want them to feel like there's some confidence there. There's some sense of control. There's some sense of, you know, knowing what to expect, what to do. We don't want anything to spook them. So um, that's, yeah, that's what I would do is I would do the treat retreat. So tossing the treat and then the dog probably will come in again because they'll be like, hmm, are you going to toss me another one? And then they toss it again, but the, they get the food from behind them. So they go further away. Great. Thanks, Nancy, for your question. Let's see. Donna says, this has been very helpful. Thanks, Donna, for the comment. Appreciate it. So let's see. We've got two more questions, and then you want to call it a night? Or you want to sure. go? Yeah. We're going on a marathon here. These are great questions. I know. I these it. are. I love it. People are keeping you on your toes here, but you yes. obviously know your stuff. So. <laughs> All right. So Sherry is asking, I'm new to knowing about your training. Do you have training videos? <laughs> Tracy, do I have training videos? You have so <laughs> many training videos. And you have some really awesome. Oh, no, wait. You have yeah. all awesome training videos, especially the ones while well, you've got the stuff in your membership. See, I'm going to mm. sell your membership right here. But you also <laughs> have all the amazing ones that you have done for the club over the last several years. So mm -hmm. Uh, Sherry, I know she'll tell you about the awesome one she has in her membership, but also if you're in our community, um, which I'll throw up our URL at the uh, end here, if you're not, um, go to the media section of the New Hampshire Dog Walking Club community, and you'll see all the great stuff that Laura has shared with us as well over the years. Yep. Um, yes. So I have so many training videos. If you could see my YouTube site unlisted, all the stuff in the back end, it would be overwhelming. So in the, in the membership, um, I have it organized for you so that yes, there's training videos on all kinds of manners, all kinds of behavior problems. Um, there's, I mean, I take videos of everything and then I turn it into video. So I have rarely had somebody ask me if I have a video and I don't have it. And if I don't have it, I'm usually like, Oh, there's a gap. I have to make one. And I usually will make it, <laughs> make it pretty quickly. So, um, so yes, I have tons of training videos, um, in my membership, but they are, I have a virtual library. So there's the, the two tiers of the membership. One is the you're all in K nine homeschooler Academy. You get the challenges, you get, um, discounts, you get the virtual library, you get, um, courses for problem behaviors. You get a course that's all about understanding your dog. So like understanding some of the science, not in a sciencey way, but just like in a way that makes it possible to understand. Um, so that's all in the main academy and more than I'm probably forgetting. But then in the lower tier of it, it's you get access to the whole virtual library and the manners course and the private Facebook group. Um, and 20% discount on any add-on stuff that you want to do. So just sort of depending on what you're working on, how involved you want to get, um, and how much you like challenges. I feel like if you like challenges, if you like having like little tasks to follow along the way, then I would go all into the regular academy. Um, but if you kind of are more of like a DIY person, it's funny, I actually made a graphic of my... Um, my lower tier is my Chihuahua people. And then my higher tier, are my border collies, because the Chihuahuas are like a little bit more independent. They like to, they like to go at their own pace. They like to do it on their own time. Um, and then the border collies are like super social. I have to be fully in control. I have to have access to everything at all times. <laughs> um, and that's kind of how I think of it when I separate the two. So definitely let me know what you're looking for and then I can direct you. Um, but yes, to answer your question in a shorter version. Yes, I have lots of training videos. <laughs> well, and also Kathy wants to know um, yes. a little bit more about your membership too. So maybe either tonight or tomorrow, can you do a post in the community with a little bit mm -hmm. more information on your membership? Because don't you have some kind of deadline that's coming up? Or yes. Something? So tomorrow, um, so right now, until tomorrow, through through the end of tomorrow, um, you can join the lower tier of the membership for just twenty dollars a month, um, and it will normally it's twenty seven. So I took seven dollars off just to make an even twenty twenty dollars for the month, um, and that's the lower tier. That's the 
the virtual library, the private Facebook group, and the manners course, and then the 20% off any other add-on stuff you want to do. So if you decide you want to do like a challenge here and there, that would be good for that. Um, and then field trips, you do have to be at a certain stage in the membership to be invited on the field trips, because I want to make sure that your dog's ready and you're ready and you're set up for success. But um, field trips are something you could add on if you wanted to. If you're in the full membership, um, that's all set up right now, you can join at any point. Um, so if you go to my website, misbehaviortraining.com and you go slash homeschooler, um, that's where you can see directly all the membership info or just I'll go to my website and, right now. and click on it either way. Um, but yeah, all the info is in there. There we go. Yeah. So that's Perfect. the right URL for you guys yep. if you wanna learn more about her training. And like I said, she'll post in the community as well. She'll give you more information there. And if you're not a member of our community yet, you can feel free to check us out at nhdog.club and you can join our free Facebook community because Laura is the featured expert this month and she's been sharing all kinds of good stuff. So you can learn more about her. And like I said, check out the media section, check out the guide section. There is a lot of things that she has already been sharing over the years in addition to just this month. Mm -hmm. All right, so Laura, we have one last question, and that does actually come from Kathy. So let me throw this one up here. See, our Grace was never reactive and is now with other dogs out on a walk. She had all the basic commands, but now pulls on a walk. She is fine with my daughter's dog and puppies. Do you have a suggestion for which muzzle is the best? I saw a mesh one on Amazon that appears to have the peanut butter space. Also would love to know more about the take a peek. Okay. So the muzzle question. So the mesh muzzles typically are the ones that will hold their mouth closed. So there might be an exception to that, but mesh is not going to be very protective if the dogs try to bite. So I would go with either the Baskerville ultra muzzle. Um, however, I will say that that is not completely bite proof. There have been studies or not studies, but I guess there have been, um, incidents or anecdotal evidence out there recently that says like it is possible for dogs to bite when they're wearing that i have yet to see it i think it would take a very aggressive dog, a dog who's really you know really into it really high drive um for it to happen so and they're they're um i don't know if it's a hard rubber like a silicone but it's definitely it's my go-to muscle for most dogs um the fit is what matters the most so there is a um, website called the muzzleupproject.com, I think. I think it's just muzzleupproject.com, but or you could just look up muzzle up project. And they have a nice list of all kinds of different muzzles. And um, they have a Facebook group that's associated with it too that will help you actually size your muzzle. And I can add a link afterwards um, to the actual Facebook group. There's another one too that will do the same thing. And you can literally like post the size of your dog's nose when they have a ball in there, like an open mouth. Ooh. Um, and stuff like that. And they will give you recommendations. But the Baskerville tends to be my go-to. There's also like Jafco muzzles. Um, I'm blanking on some of them right now because the Baskerville is my go-to. But um, but I'll get you the website and all that. And the main thing though, is you want a basket muzzle. You don't want one that holds your mouth closed because they need to be able to pant fully. They should be able to drink water. Um, technically they should be able to hold a ball in their mouth, but not within the muzzle. Don't actually do that with the muzzle on. <laughs> um, and, but that's how, that's how much space that they should have. Okay. So there is a lot. And then the muzzle up project too, it has some great training videos on muzzle stuff. I do have some, but that is one that I have directed to the muzzle up projects. It's done such an awesome job with it that I just said, like, you know what, that's probably one series of videos I don't necessarily need right now, but that's the only one. <laughs> Well, wonderful questions, you guys. Thank you very much. We're going to go actually here to um, the Wheel of Names and pick from all the great questions that were asked by so many people on who's going to win the free month of homes for the Homeschooler Academy. But if you don't get picked, here is the URL so that you can go and check it out from Laura. And as she mentioned, the uh, new tier that she offered uh, that she just established, which is $20 a month, does end tomorrow. So make sure you go check that out if that is something that you are interested in doing kind of that more independent study. So any last thoughts, Laura, before we go to the wheel of names? 
I don't think so. I think we covered a lot. I don't want to okay. overwhelm people too much. I mean, I can, you know me, I can talk about training forever. So, but it's almost my bedtime. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll cool it. <laughs> I know we're a little old, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody, again. And thank yes, you, Laura, thanks. so much for spending almost 90 minutes with us of, of great, great information. So um, these are all the people that asked questions throughout the, uh, the conversation. And so we're going to spin now. And this is the person who's going to get that one-month free membership in the Homeschooler Academy with Laura. Dun, dun, dun. And it's going to be Rhonda G. Rhonda. Congratulations. Congratulations, Rhonda. Yes. So I will get you all set up with that. Um, Tracy will get me your info um, pretty easily. And then I will reach out and I will get you set up to get you started. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you again, everybody. We really appreciate your comments and questions. And thank you, Laura. I hope everybody has a great night. And uh, check us out in the Dog Walking Club community because Laura is the featured expert through the end of the month. All yes. right, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.